Hello Year 3, I hope you're all well and you're keeping safe. I've got the lovely pleasure of reading Chapter 9 of The Butterfly Lion to you today. So we're going to get started. All you need is a ruler, Chapter 9 and maybe your following finger if you don't want a ruler. But you're going to follow along and then there will be some questions set for you just as you have been doing with your whole class reading. And I'm very, very excited to see all your work that you come back with. So let's get started. Chapter 9, A Lot of Old Codswallop. The dog was whining at the kitchen door. Let Jack out for me, will you? said the old lady. There's a dear. I'll tell you what. I'll fetch down the kite Bertie made for me, shall I? You'd like to see it, wouldn't you? And she went out. I was only too happy to let the dog out and shut the door on him. She was back sooner than I expected. There, she said, setting the kite down on the table in front of me. What do you think of it then? It was huge, much bigger than I had expected, and covered in dust. It was made of brown canvas stretched over a wooden frame. All the kites I had seen been more colourful, more flamboyant. I think the disappointment must have shown in my face. She still flies, you know, she said, blowing the dust off. You should see how she goes. You should see her. She sat down in the chair and I waited for her to begin again. Now then, where was I? She sassed. I'm so forgetful these days. Bertie's last letter, I said. He was just going off to the war. But what about the white lion? The white prince? What's happened to him? I could hear the dog barking wildly outside. She smiled at me. Everything comes to those who wait, she says. Why don't you look out of the window? I looked. The lion on the hillside was blue no more. It was white now, and the dog was bounding across the hillside, chasing away a cloud of blue butterflies that rose all around him. He chases everything that moves, she says. But don't you worry. He won't catch a single one. He never catches anything. Not the lion, I said. I, I meant the lion in the story. What happened to him? Don't you see? They're the same. The lion out there on the hillside and the lion in the story, they're the same. I don't understand, I said. You soon will, she replied. You soon will. She took a deep breath before she could begin again. For many years, Bertie never spoke about fighting in the trenches. He always said it was a nightmare best forgotten, best kept to himself. But later on, when he'd had the time to reflect, when time had done its healing perhaps, then he told me something of how it had been. At dawn, they always had to come out of their dugouts and stand too in the trenches, just in case there was an attack. The Germans often attacked at dawn. That's how it was on the morning of his 20th birthday. They came swarming over no man's land out of the early morning sun. But they were soon spotted and mown down like so much ripe corn. Then they were turning and running. The whistle went and Bertie led his men over the top to counterattack. But as always, the Germans were expecting them and the usual slaughter began. Bertie was hit in the leg and fell into a shell hole. He thought of waiting there all day and then crawling back under the cover of darkness. But his wounds were bleeding badly and he could not staunch it. He decided he had to try to crawl back to the trenches whilst he still had the strength to do it. Hugging the ground, he was almost at the wire, almost back to safety, when he heard someone crying out in no man's land. It was a cry that he could not ignore. He found two of his men lying side by side and so badly wounded they could not move. One of them was already unconscious. He hoisted him onto his shoulders and made for the trenches. The bullets whipping and whining around him. The man was heavy and Bertie fell several times under his weight. But he got himself to his feet again and staggered on until they tumbled together down into the trench. The stretcher bearers tried to take Bertie away. He'd bleed to death, they said, but he would not listen. 
One of his own men was still lying wounded out there in no man's land and he was going to bring him in no matter what. Waving his hands above his head, Bertie climbed out of the trench and walked forward. The firing stopped almost at once. He was so weak himself by now that he could scarcely walk. But he managed to reach the wounded man and drag him back. They say that in the end, both sides, German and British, were up on the parapets, cheering him on as he stumbled back towards his lines. Then other men were running out to help him, and after that, he didn't know any more. When he woke up, he found himself in a hospital, lying in a bed, with the two friends he had rescued on either side. He was still there some weeks later when he was told that he was to be awarded the Victoria Cross for his bravery under fire. He was the hero of the hour, the pride of his regiment. When he woke up, he found himself in a hospital lying in a bed with the two friends he had rescued on either side. He was still there some weeks later when he was told that he was to be awarded the Victoria Cross for his bravery under fire. He was the hero of the hour, the pride of his regiment. Afterwards, Bertie always called it a lot of old codswallop. To be really brave, he said, you have to overcome fear. You have to be frightened in the first place. And he hadn't been. There wasn't time to be frightened. He did what he did without thinking. Just as he had saved the white lion cub, all those years before when he was a boy in Africa. Of course, they made a great fuss of him at the hospital and he loved all of that. But his leg did not heal as well as it should have. He was still there in the hospital when I found him. It was not entirely by accident that I found him. For over three years now, there had been no letter, no word from him at all. He had warned me, I know, but the long silence was hard to bear. Every time the postman came, I hoped, and the pang of disappointment was sharper each time there was no letter from him. I told all to Nanny Mason, who dried my tears and told me to pray, and that she would too. She was sure there'd be a letter soon. Without Nanny, I don't know how I would have gone on living. I was so miserable. I had seen the wounded men coming back from France, blinded, gassed, crippled, and always dreaded seeing Bertie's face amongst them. I had seen the long list in the newspapers of all the men who had been killed or who were missing. I looked each day for his name and thanked God every time I did not find it. But still, he never wrote, and I had to know why. I thought maybe he had been so badly wounded that he could not write, that he was lying in some hospital alone and unloved. So I determined I would become a nurse. I would go to France and heal and comfort as best as I could and just hope that somehow I might find him. But I soon discovered that amongst so many men in uniform, it would be hopeless to go looking for him. I did not even know his regiment nor his rank. I had no idea where to begin. I was sent to a hospital some 50 miles behind the lines, not too far from Amiens. The hospital was a converted chateau with turrets and great wide staircases and chandeliers in the wards. But it was so cold in winter that many of the men died as much from the cold as from their wounds. We did all we could for them, but we were short of doctors and short of medicines. There were always so many men coming in and their wounds were terrible, so terrible. Each time we saved one, it was such a joy to us. In the midst of all the suffering all around us, we needed some joy, believe me. I was at breakfast one morning. It was June of 1918. I was reading a magazine the Illustrated London News. I remember when I turned the page and saw a face I knew at once. He was older, thinner in the face and unsmiling, but I was sure it was Bertie. His eyes were deep set and gentle, just as I remember them. 
and there was his name, Captain Albert Andrews VC. There was a whole article underneath about what he had done and how he was still recovering from his wounds in a hospital. A hospital that turned out to be little more than 10 miles away. Wild horses would not have kept me from him. The next Sunday, I cycled over. He was sleeping when I saw him first, propped up on his pillows, one hand behind his head. Hello, I said. He opened his eyes and frowned at me. It was a moment or two before he knew me. Been in the wars, have you? I said. Something like that, he replied. At 17, he'd found himself marching with his regiment along the straight roads of northern France up to the front line, heads and hearts high with hope and expectation. Within a few months, he was sitting huddled at the bottom of a muddy trench, hands over his head, head between his knees, curling himself into himself as tight as he would go, sick with terror as the shells whiz-bang flew the world apart around him. Then the whistle would blow, and they'd be out, and over the top into no man's land, bayonets fixed and walking towards the German trenches, into the rat-tat-tat of machine gun fire. To the left of him, and to the right of him, his friends would fall, and he would walk on, waiting for the bullet with his name on which he knew could cut him down at any moment. Well, I don't know about you, Year 3, but that was a rather exciting chapter that we've just read together. I'm very, very excited to see your Medal of Bravery that you create. So send those pictures in and I will look forward to seeing them all. So for now, take care, stay safe, and I will see you all soon. Bye.